I'm going to basically talk about three things. The past of computer science education, the current status, and the future. And again, I'm going to feed off of what the previous speakers have already mentioned. Of course, you can't do anything in education without a quiz, so I give you the quiz first. What are these people doing? What is their job? I give you some suggestions. What would you think? Go ahead and just shout it out. Data processor, secretary, none of the above. These people are programmers. And it doesn't look like they're programmers because what a computer is today and what it is back then are very different things. These people physically put wires into sockets and flip switches to determine what that computer would do. What is that shadowy figure in the back standing in front of? What are those little boxes around the side? Very good. None of the above is they are computers. They had to physically move around a room to actually access the computer. So you did very well on the quiz. I would like to start with the history of computer science, pulling a page out of um, Brian McGee's book, Confessions of a Philosopher, fantastic book. He didn't reveal philosophy as it occurred chronologically. He actually talked about how philosophy was revealed to him. So I'm going to do a similar thing with computer science. And I would love to show you the first computer that I ever programmed, but I can't because I never saw it. It was in this room at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, go Illini. <laughs> and I simply punched holes in cardboard cards and gave those cards to a shadowy figure. <laughs> and that figure disappeared in, in two, three, four hours later. I got a piece of paper that said, rip up card 12 and punch it again. That did not inspire me to switch my major <laughs> from mathematics to computer science. But I still was fascinated by computer science. So I'm going to give you a little history of the multiple personalities I had to take on while I was in computer science education. In the late 70s, I got to touch my first computer, the Apple II, and I wrote software teaching students how to solve linear equations, I was thrilled. I purchased in the early 80s my first Apple II, and I recall working, and I recall a hand coming from the side with a sandwich, and I grabbed the sandwich, and I ate and continued, and 13 hours later, I thought I'd better take a break. That was the inspiration, the joy of creating that I would like to convey to my students, and I do see in my students on a daily basis. That middle computer was when the district at which I was working decided that these apples were kind of toys and we wanted to bring in the business machines, so I started teaching on an IBM PS225. You remember those? Great machines, I enjoyed them. At the same time, I started working summers. I was told early in my career, you do not get summers off. You better find something to do. So I took that advice seriously, and I started working at a research lab called Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory, where I started working on spark stations. And I'd like to also show you the mainframe, the VAX mainframe that I was working on, but again, I never saw it. I sat in a room and worked on a terminal and actually produced three-dimensional graphics for physicists. This was back in the late 80s. And my mentor, Dr. Leo Michelotti, incredible gentleman, said, I want you to learn C++. Go buy a book. And I went out and looked for a book. In 1989, there were two books in the, on the bookshelf. One was Bjarne Strustrup's book. He wrote the language. I thought, this has got to be a great book. The other one was some primer by Stanley Lipman. I grabbed Strustrup's book, had no clue what he was saying went back and, and grabbed the other one and, and made some progress. The, the graphic at the bottom that you'll see is actually six-dimensional phase space. And the physicist was trying to visualize what was going on with these subatomic particles as they accelerated in this four-mile in circumference ring. So he would, of course, not look at the six-dimensional space, but take two- and three-dimensional cross-sections of that space and then reach over to a dial and turn the dial and watch the three-dimensional renderings rotate so we could see it from different perspectives. This was the joy of my professional life. Fantastic. Um, after looking at the different hardware that I had to deal with, and I, I omitted some, 
I omitted the Mac and DOS I had during my schizophrenic phase where I had to run Macintosh software and then I'd flip a switch and go to DOS software and back and forth. I, I omitted some of the other machines I worked at at the, the lab. But another thing we had to deal with is the languages. First language I ever programmed in was Fortran. That was punching the holes in the cards. But then I quickly moved to AppleSoft Basic, fun stuff. And then, of course, Steve Wozniak wrote this really interesting uh, ROM program that allowed you to manipulate the memory. So start doing the machine language memory manipulation to generate these absolutely beautiful patterns. But when people started getting serious about computer science education, they said, we need a language that will allow you to more structure what you're doing. So we brought in Pascal, and I used that to teach AP computer science to my first computer science teacher, or student ever, Tim Wong, who was double major math computer science at MIT, who then went to Berkeley and did artificial intelligence research. And I am so proud of him today because he is a computer science professor at Middlebury College. So a fantastic gentleman. But he did the first AP program using Pascal. And now I move to two more languages. These languages represented a dramatic shift in how people communicated with computers. C++ and Java have this commonality that you no longer have to just deal with instructions to tell the computer what to do, but you can actually look at concept models, create classes. I have a dancer. I would like to create a dancer object and have that dancer do what a dancer does. I would like to create a TED conference and have all the concepts associated with a TED concept modeled in my program. That's what these two languages allowed me to do. So after we've gone through the different hardware and the different software, and we now look at what actually were students doing in these pastimes, we look at the history of computer science again from my educational perspective. It usually was dark, shadowy figures sitting behind a terminal. You really couldn't see that they were there, but you knew they were there. And every once in a while, they'd actually say, hey, look at this, look at this. And it was usually a video game. Hey, this is cool, look at what I made. So that's pretty much the focus in the past. And these are the kind of things we did. There was an advanced placement course back in 1984, and now it has broken into an A course and an AB course but they've recently eliminated that AB course, which brought a lot of sorrow to many people. But as you're gonna see, when you look at the current stages of computer science, and you look at why I'm here in California, I took this picture of two baby hummingbirds outside my kitchen window. And this was the day before they flew away. And I thought, that's computer science education. It is the birth of brand new ideas, brand new pedagogies, and this thing off to the right, honestly, I have no idea what it is. <laughs> but it's off at the end of Lindero Canyon, up at the top of a mountain, and I looked at that and I thought, I have no idea what this is, but it's a lot like computer science education. <laughs> there are people doing very cool things, and I'm sure it could grow into just beauty, but I'm not quite sure yet. <laughs> and out of some of these charred remains of attempts, you do have these beautiful creations propping up. And so I see on the horizon incredible things. How are we gonna get this done? And how are we gonna get this done very quickly? A minute and 45 seconds. There's the future of computer science. Even if that was not my daughter, this would probably be one of my favorite pictures ever. <laughs> she is exploring on the computer. She wanted to accomplish something and the joy that she found by actually solving that problem to me was priceless. And again, when somebody said big idea and what's your focus? Children, my children primarily, everyone's children, the entire world, that's my passion, that's my focus. What should computer science education be? I walked into a store in Chicago and the computer said, what do you want to eat? I said, I want this. And they said, okay, would you like any other items? Okay, sure, I'll take that and that. How much would you like to pay? Okay, that's the pay. I swiped my credit card and I was done. A software designer designed a system that could communicate with me and accomplish that task so that the people there could interact, could serve food, and not worry about some of the repetitive processes associated with the restaurant. The picture to the right 
is my son talking to me from Bangalore, India, showing me currency because a software designer decided this would be a cool thing to have, this kind of capability, are the things that the future of computer science education are going to be doing. Notice that the creativity process is a big part of this, and we need more nail polish in computer science education. <laughs> is a very, very underrepresented population. And this year we have six females in computer science. And from the Grace Hopper Women in Computing Conference, I brought back nail polish. They loved it, jumped right onto it. <laughs> so how are we going to do this? There is a principles commission. And this principles commission is incredibly creative people that are also inspired by these advisors from all over the country and these people are creating a brand new course. And the course is led by Owen Astrakhan, Amy Briggs, principal investigators. And here are the big ideas. You can look at them on, on uh, the web later, but you can see it's similar to what the people in the previous presentations were talking about. Big ideas, creativity. We're talking about abstraction, making simple what we want to discuss. Data and information are huge. Algorithms. Programming is definitely a part of the new course, but it's not necessarily the focus of the only thing. Computer systems and networks. And then finally, computing enables innovation, creativity. That is the course we're designing. That is the course we will pilot in the next year, five universities throughout the country. The following year, 10 universities and five high schools. Very exciting time. So what I would like to do is close with Bobby Kennedy quoting Bernard Shaw or George Bernard Shaw. We have always taught students to look at things how they are and ask why. We need to, as educators, inspire students to look at how they could be and ask why not. Thank you very much. <laughs>